to work on the Public Budget Committee. Um, I'm Brianna's secretary. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, we're really excited to have Matt here. Um, before we get started, I just want to talk a little bit about the summer series and then briefly give a quick introduction to Matt. Uh, throughout the summer, we've invited political analysts and historians to talk about a variety of topics. Uh, the series has been unique for its focus on method. Uh, namely, how should we as socialists go about analyzing and considering political situations? What kinds of questions we need to ask to make sense of history, uh, and what kind of questions we need to ask to make sense of history and political struggles? Through the discussion of method, we've examined history through a materialist lens. We've asked what kind of data do we need in order to start making theories or causal explanations, and consequently, what the grounds are for criticizing these theories and explanations. Uh, this series emerged out of the Marxism and Politics Reading Group which for the past year and a half has read foundational texts in Marxist theory and history. Uh, ahead of each of the talks, the Marxism and Politics Reading Group reads texts assigned by the upcoming lecturer, and we discuss them here, and discuss them before. Uh, tonight, Matt will be talking to the group about abolitionism, the early Republican Party, and the fight against slavery. After Matt's lecture, we'll have a good chunk of time to open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, I'll also be asking some of the questions the Marxism and Politics Group goes to. Uh, Matt Carr, I just you looked at this from the, your profile. Yeah. Like, don't read, don't feel like you have to know. No, no, I don't. Uh, Matt Carr is an associate professor of history at Princeton University. He's an historian of the U.S. Civil War era and its relationship to the 19th century world. Uh, he received his PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania in, 20, in 2011 and joined the Princeton faculty in 2013. Uh, his first book, This Vast Southern Empire, Slaveholders of the Helm of American Foreign Policy, explores the ways that slavery shaped U.S. foreign relations before the Civil War. Uh, Carp's now working on a book about the emergence of anti-slavery mass politics in the United States, and in particular, the radical vision of the Republican Party in the 1850s. Uh, he's also a member of the Central Brooklyn branch of DSA, contributing editor of Jackman, and has written about American politics uh, and 19th century history for Jackman, the nation of Boston Review, public books, and elsewhere. Uh, so now, uh, hand it over to Matt to take away. Hey, okay, let's see. How's that sound? Pretty good. All right. Um, first of all, yeah, thanks, Tyler. Uh, thanks, Brianna, uh, for organizing this. This is a really, really cool opportunity. I've never, I've done political writing and a little bit of speaking, and I've done a lot of academic historical writing and speaking. I haven't really done historical speaking for political groups, which is sort of cool. It's a good genre. Um, I think uh, maybe we should do more of it. Um, first, though, I guess I wanted to ask, uh, how many of you guys did the reading? Just out of curiosity. Okay, because there was like actually a side reading for this group, but it seems like a lot of you did. Okay, cool. So, I mean, maybe ultimately the way that we'll run this will be more seminar style. We'll see. I did bring prepared remarks, so it'll be like one of those seminars where the professor just goes off for 40 minutes and then it's like, hey, is this a great discussion? Um, but I hope we will have time for a real robust back and forth uh, afterwards. Um, yeah. The emergence of anti-slavery po mass politics in the United States in the 1850s. That's the subject today. I mean, I do think this is important. Uh, for me, this is the decade that witnessed the most profound political revolution in American history. Uh, not just the triumph of America's only victorious third party, the Republican Party, obviously. Uh, but I think the most explicit uh, overthrow of a ruling class, uh, in political terms anyway, the slaveholding elite uh, that this country's ever experienced. Uh, and it, it, in my view, and the, sort of the basic premise of my book, and all the research I'm doing on this in some ways, is that this antebellum political revolution, as we could call it, uh, was what made possible the even more dramatic social revolution of the Civil War and Reconstruction. And I do think this question, how was the slave power overthrown, uh, not only demands sort of intensive study on its own terms as sort of one of the pivotal three or four episodes in national history and in some significant ways international history. Uh, but it has special significance for anyone trying to advance a political revolution in the United States today, despite myriad differences and you know inapposite historical analogies, blah, blah, blah. I still think it, this does demand our study, uh, along with a couple other episodes in, in, in American history, among many local episodes. 
So, yeah, uh, this is still a work in progress before I sort of sink in, um, which is great because it means that I get to benefit from all your feedback. Uh, it's part of this book I'm working on, uh, and it's also even more immediately part of a piece I'm writing for Catalyst, which is going to come out in September, I think, which Vivek uh, said today, which is, means that I really got to get moving on these revisions. So, you guys can help me with that. But uh, some of that is going to show up in here, too. But I'm really curious for your responses. Okay, so let's begin where all political meetings uh, should begin with an epic take, a truly epic take. <laughs> uh, and, a, and a new character, maybe, for some of you. So, little in Marianne Shad, Shad's eventful life. How many of you have heard of Marianne Shad or Marianne Shad Carey? I think she's still relatively unknown in U.S. history. Uh, little in Marianne Shad's eventful life encouraged her to underestimate the power of American slavery. Raised by three black parents in Westchester, Pennsylvania, only a little ways west of here, she grew up helping runaway slaves high from the law at her family home. And her budding career as an educator, anti slavery activist, though, was changed forever in 1850 when the Future Slave Act passed and sort of confirmed what had already been in many ways true uh, that every black person in the United States, whether free or enslaved, was a target for legalized kidnapping. At age 28, Shad moved to Canada. And Toronto, she published The Provincial Freedman, a newspaper devoted to advocating black immigration from the U.S. to Canada. She was not somebody who was inclined to be optimistic about the prospects for political change in the United States. Uh, she called the slavery cursed republic of her birth. We do not think we can be too severe, she wrote, on the Negro haters, slaveholders, and colonizationists of the United States. Uh, and yet, within just a few years of her immigration to Canada, Shad saw uh, it's an interesting perch on American politics in the 1850s, you know, a black colony in Canada. Shad saw that a political cyclone was rattling the foundations of slavery's power in the United States itself. In the election of 1856, this brand new Republican Party emerged and won over 11 northern states and over a million northern votes on a platform that proclaimed slavery a relic of barbarism. This is something new. It wasn't enough to elect John C. Fremont, their candidate, as president, but it was enough to convince Marianne Chad, who became Marianne Chad Carey, she got married that year, that the election was merely the precursor of a more terrific storm than has hitherto been witnessed. So long as the American anti-slavery movement, and this is the teeth of it, was confined, quote, to the abolition, abolitionists of the North, moved only by compassion for the slave, Chad Carey said, the power of slaveholders had been secure. But the emergence of a national anti-slavery political party changed everything. The United States, now she predicted, would witness a perfect hurricane of sentiment. For the first time in national history, Republicans had successfully linked the brutality of bondage to the political self-interest of ordinary Northern voters, who were now convinced that an aristocratic, tyrannical slave power threatened their most fundamental freedoms and interests. With remarkable suddenness, then, the anti-slavery struggle had moved from the domain of moralized activism into the arena of mass political struggle. And for Shaq Carey, this portended both tragedy and triumph. Here's the takeaway line, probably the title of my book. Instead of a handful of abolitionists from motives of humanity, the world beholds millions of abolitionists from necessity. And depends upon it, there will be hard and bloody work before the struggle terminates. So obviously she was right. Obviously this was one of the all-time great takes in American history. In the Hall of Fame of takes, you have Marion Shaq Carey calling her shot on the Civil War front and center um, five years early. I mean, she wasn't the only one to call it, but uh, I think the, even within her prediction, the analysis is what is significant for me. Uh, the emphasis on the significance of the Republican Party, on the importance of mass politics, that is millions, not handfuls, and on the power of necessity rather than humanity as the driver of a truly revolutionary change in the 1850s. And that's more or less where I come down, and the, that's the sort of opening premise for this talk. Uh, well, I guess what I want to do with, with the rest of the time is to lay out what I'm going to do, zoom out a little bit and make the stakes of this even more clear and more dramatic. Hopefully it won't be too basic for you, but uh, to sort of set the stage about why this, the revolution of 1860 should be seen as an anti-slavery revolution. And then uh, a few minutes talking about uh, competing interpretations, and I won't go deep into historiography, but since you guys have you guys have been diligent on, on the reading. Uh, I can handle. I can handle some of that. Uh, how my own take fits into the universe of arguments about the Republican Party, etc. And then in the end, I'll spend a little time building a more detailed case about why we should regard uh, the rise of Republicans in the 
1950s as a kind of a populist uh, democratic uh, political revolution and what it might, why that might matter, or maybe not matter. Okay, so this is, to begin sort of where my first book left off uh, in some ways. In the middle decades of the 19th century, the United States was the largest, the strongest, and the richest chattel slave society in the history of the modern world. By 1860, nearly 4 million enslaved laborers, valued collectively at over $3 billion, uh, produced an agricultural profit that accounted for well over half American exports. The U.S. was not alone, right, as a slave holding society by Brazil, and Cuba, elsewhere, but by far, by far the richest and most powerful and most influential in the Atlantic. Uh, at a moment when there were more enslaved people, enslaved workers, enslaved goods, enslaved produced goods than ever before, uh, the political and economic power in the U.S. led the way. Right? And yet in that same year of 1860, these same powerful slaveholders began a movement to abandon the commanding heights of U.S. state power, flee the American Union, and establish their own breakaway republic in the South. Right? Five years later, American slavery itself was abolished. The largest, strongest slaveholding society, slaveholding society in the modern world was destroyed and revolutionized from without and from within. Uh, as my old advisor Steve Hahn argued here at Penn, uh, few ruling classes in global history, all of the modern world, fell so hard, so far, and so fast as American slaveholders in the 1860s. So, again, reasons for us to pay attention. And how did this happen? I mean, I do think a premise for me is that, uh, which I explore in more length in this catalyst piece, is that the United States was relatively distinctive in the history of the Atlantic world, maybe even the modern world, in ending slavery not through royal decree, judicial verdict, or armed insurrection. Uh, those are the more familiar routes to emancipation. But instead, in some ways, through mass democratic politics. Of course, electoral victories alone didn't abolish slavery. That required the hard and bloody work of the Civil War, as Marion Chad Terry called it. But, uh, but every emancipation of that Civil War, from the Confiscation Acts to the 13th Amendment, were all threatened, executed, announced, sustained, confirmed democratically by an anti-slavery political party that won office through national elections. This was like a fundamental component of the anti-slavery struggle, was winning at the ballot box. Uh, and it, it was the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 that set these revolutionary events in motion above all. Uh, and to be sure, as historians correctly note, and we can discuss it at length if you want, um, Lincoln and the Republicans did promise to avoid all direct interference with slavery in the South. Uh, the Constitution, the Republican Party standard line was, did not allow the federal government to overrule state laws allowing slavery. Instead, the new president of his party, this is something Jim Oakes has written a lot about, uh, sought to undermine the institution indirectly by forbidding its expansion, encircling it with free states, and starving it of vital support from Washington. That's the kind of Republican policy line. Yet, what most terrifies southern slaveholders in my emphasis today is not really anti-slavery policy in its various forms that occupy a lot of discussion, airtime historically, but actually anti-slavery politics. We can make that distinction. Uh, and especially the rise of an anti-slavery mass public in the North. And Southern slaveholders made that distinction themselves in their own secessionist speeches, which is interesting to me. Mississippi did not abandon the Union, it said, because Lincoln was scheduled to take office in two months. Uh, it withdrew, secessionist leaders declared, because Lincoln and his party had claimed the whole popular mind of the North. In the recent election, Georgia's secession is explained by the same token. The party of Lincoln called the Republican Party is admitted to be an anti-slavery party. Anti-slavery is its mission and purpose. By anti-slavery, it is a power in the North, in the state. This was not so much about what the Republicans were going to do on day one in office, but on the political process that had allowed them to arrive, and what that might mean for where power resided in the country, for, the slip, for, for slavery's grip on uh, American politics. And on the opposite end of the political spectrum, Frederick Douglass largely agreed. Douglass never dropped his own criticism of this Republican political formula, the, the sort of opposition to extension and unwillingness to sort of directly rule out, directly outlaw slavery in the states. He had a different interpretation of the Constitution that said the federal government could just do that uh, on the basis of the preamble of the Constitution, on the basis of the Declaration, on the basis of the Fifth Amendment, etc. Um, but more significantly, uh, he scoffed at Lincoln's futile effort and other Republicans' futile efforts to reassure Southerners by sort of citing the limits of their anti-slavery program. The difficulty is, he said, the slaveholders understand the position of the Republican Party all too well. 
For Douglas, like Mary Ashton Carey, the Republican organization drew its strength not from the wisdom of its leadership or the purity of its principles, but the mass politics that had swept it into office. The election of 1860 said proved that the masses of the North, the power behind the throne, had determined to take and keep this government out of the hands of the slaveholding oligarchy to administer it hereafter uh, to the advantage of free labor against slave labor. Now that the mighty North was aroused and organized against bondage, said Douglas, the slaveholders were right to flee the Union because the power, quote, the power of slavery is broken. It's a bold thing to say in April of 1861 when the power of slavery still kept 4 million people enslaved. So, how do we come at this historically? Beginning with Marx's own journalism in the 50s and 60s, thinkers on the left have almost always acknowledged that electoral struggles were, were crucial, at least played for a key ingredient, at least part of the picture in ending slavery in the U.S., right? In the classic formulation of W.B. Du Bois, slavery was ultimately destroyed by an abolition democracy. That's his key phrase. An extraordinary alliance, unique in U.S. history, that ultimately linked anti-slavery voters in the North with enslaved African Americans in the South that ultimately freed people. In Black Reconstruction, Du Bois chronicled the extraordinary achievements of that alliance during the war and during, and afterwards all the way to its disruption and defeat uh, in the late 60s and 70s. But the most crucial link in the chain, I think, one of the premises of, of my argument here is that it was forged actually before the war began, before Du Bois' story began, in the course of political struggle against slavery's power in government. Maybe it's better if I go a little farther away. Right? Is, that, is that right? Yeah, kind of a sucking in this mic here, okay. Um, the antebellum construction of an anti-slavery majority within the North alone, as C.L.R. James has also, also wrote about it, was an essential precondition for the wartime political bond between northern politicians, northern soldiers, and southern slaves. It was votes, as Du Bois wrote in The Souls of Black Road, that made war and emancipated millions. The triumph of the Republican Party, in a sense, and the defeat of the slaveholding class, should not be seen as the achievement of elites or even uh, vanguard or virtuous activists, but in every meaningful sense, a triumph of the people, writ large. Yet, if the political victory of anti-slavery was truly a kind of democratic revolution, I think it, it hasn't always received the attention that such a revolution might merit uh, from thinkers, writers on the left, etc. For many 20th century Marxists, uh, as you guys may well know, the political struggle against the slave power all through the Civil War was less a triumph of popular democracy than the hegemonic victory of a new form of northern industrial capitalism. And that was a kind of standard Marxist take. Uh, through much of the 20th century. Uh, and unquestionably, it's true that economic transformations in the North, um, including the decline of bound labor, the spread, spread of wage relations, the development of this kind of cohesive interlinked market economy between the Northeast and the Northwest, did offer a material foundation for Republican success in the 50s. As Eric Foner, you know, not in explicitly Marxist terms, but very much influenced by uh, Marxist thinking, it's influentially argued, uh, in some ways, the Republicans attack on the backward and undeveloped South, uh, which, and, and, their, and their own celebration of Northern free labor, free labor ideology is the, is the phrase that Connor basically coined. Uh, Kink grew out of a loyalty to, he says, the, small, the society of small scale capitalism, uh, which they perceived in the North. But over the last couple decades, as you guys may know, there's been a wave of scholarship that has pushed back against some of these uh, basic premises, right? That has challenged. Our, our view of slavery's position in the mid 19th century world, uh, we now see or see again or see with new clarity or, or, or however you want to put it that the rise of industrial capitalism was not necessarily antagonistic uh, to the Atlantic plantation complex. In many ways, it was dynamically and brutally compatible with it, right? Uh, to produce vital staples for these industrialized societies, developing economies in the North, etc. So in, in Europe, slave laborers were worked harder and more efficiently than ever. Mississippi, that's, those are the stats I read at the beginning of the talk. Now, not everyone is totally sold on this. These arguments go on, and the purpose today isn't actually to intervene in that kind of slavery capitalism debate as, as, a, as a topic of economic history. But I do think I'm more interested in unraveling, I think, the very underdeveloped political interpretation, it, it, uh, political implications of this new movie. Um, because I think we can hardly return, however that, however that argument pans out, to older explanations that posited this kind of total opposition between slavery and capitalism. 
narrative that assumes slavery's inevitable decline in the face of modern development, right? And contemporary opponents of bondage knew this as well as any later historian. New York Senator William Seward, who, for better or worse, you're going to get a lot of uh, in the next 15 minutes, uh, not just because I visited his house this summer, if you ever in Auburn, New York, he had a magnificent house. Uh, uh, Seward was probably the most best known and the most influential anti slavery politician in the 1850s, far more important than Lincoln in building and shaping the worldview of the Republican ideology, and especially in communicating it to, um, to Northern voters. Seward made this, this point about slavery and economics clear. So long as slavery shall possess the cotton fields, he said in 1850, the sugar fields and the rice fields of the world, so long will commerce and capital yielded toleration and sympathy. And despite the economic changes that swept across the North and South alike, accelerating rapidly after the 1820s, the political order of Annabelle America remained relatively stable, impressively stable, if you could say. Slaveholders within Northern allies retained and remained the helm of both major national parties, the Whig Party and the Democratic Party, and remained committed to keeping uh, arguments about slavery on the margins of national politics, of mainstream politics. Even after those arguments bubbled over here or there in the late 1840s, the Compromise of 1850, forged and strongly backed by Northern elites, political and economic elites from New York to New Orleans, um, strongly, I think, demonstrating the resilience of this existing regime and the ongoing weakness of its radical foes. As late as 1852, the Free Soil Party, the only explicitly anti-slavery party in the race, uh, garnered less than five percent of the national vote, uh, just eight years before Lincoln uh, won a national election. In some ways, this is a very rapid transformation. That's why the book and my work is really zooming in explicitly on that kind of period from 1853 to 1860. So in this environment, I think, overcoming the entrenched power of bondage required something more than the kind of convenient maturation of a free labor economy and wage labor economy in the North. Uh, William Seward, uh, like many Republicans, pointed not to economic transformation, but political organization as the formula for overthrowing the rule of the master class. The whole number uh, of slaveholders is only 350,000, declared 1855, not just one hundredth part of the, net of the entire population of our country. He didn't have like a Bernie accent, but he was calling out uh, an Annabelle of one percent. And, and those of you who read the the, the piece by William Gannap, um, you know the Republican the, the Republican Party's emphasis on the slave power and on the numbers, the small numbers that made up the slave power, uh, it really was a one percent, almost literally. Um, you know, sort of points Gannap doesn't emphasize this so much, but in the context of this conversation, to me it shows that they see the, Repu the slave power's Achilles heel not as economic. Not as it's going to be railroaded by some, by some superior northern efficiency, but as political, because it's a, it's politically tiny and it depends on all sorts of these other alliances, these other indirect forces. If we attack it at the jugular, at its political political appeal over the northern masses, uh, we can defeat it. That's, that's what Seward said more or less. What is wanted? He said, in fact, organization, organization, nothing but organization. And so by September of 1860, with a, a now well-organized Republican Party on the verge of winning its first national election, Seward again made the same point, stressing the passivity and the reluctance of any northern economic elite to, to, to challenge the existing political order. Only a mass political movement starting from below could really, could really threaten the slave power. There is no virtue in a commercial, or maybe, I just love these Seward quotes, sorry. There, there, there can be no virtue in a commercial or manufacturing community to maintain a democracy when the democracy themselves do not want a democracy. That is, the voters themselves, if they're not speaking and acting. There's no virtue in Pearl Street, Wall Street, and Court Street, in Chestnut Street, shout out Chestnut Street, uh, capital of Philadelphia uh, Financial District, then. In any street of the great commercial cities that can save this great democratic government of ours when you cease to uphold it with your intelligent votes, you must therefore lead us. And so, uh, two months later, the democracy, that is the millions of Northern voters, led by electing Lincoln uh, with more votes than any previous presidential candidate had ever received, uh, 12 times as many as John Hale, the free soil candidate, got in 1852. I think this really was a political revolution and transformation. So what does it mean to approach, approach it this way? I think there are a couple important implications. Uh, for history and for politics. Uh, the struggle, for one, the struggle to, to destroy slavery in the United States, as Du Bois discusses in Black Reconstruction, produced 
uh, more violent, more radical, and more revolutionary results than virtually anywhere else in the hemisphere, with the possible exception of Haiti, but arguably not even Haiti, uh, in terms of scale, in terms of actually the democratic revolution of Reconstruction, with, of which there's no parallel in Haiti. Uh, in the Catalyst essay, I spent a lot more time, and we can talk about this if you're interested, thinking about U.S. emancipation in this kind of hemispheric context, and the ways that popular anti-slavery politics uh, in ways that were subtly different from Britain or Brazil, uh, where there, are, there were parallel popular movements, uh, produced this distinctive outcome. Building on the voice of abolition democracy, I think it's worth paying attention to the special ways in which the mass politics of the 1850s began to forge a new and meaningful alliance between radical abolitionists, millions of northern voters, and millions more enslaved people in the South. And there are sort of subtle and less subtle ways in which I think that's already happening in the 50s. Um, but today I want to talk, I want to zero in for the next, I don't know, hopefully not more than 10, two minutes, about the nature of the Republican political appeal itself as it played out in Northern politics after 1854. For a lot of historians, and maybe I'm, I hope I'm not getting too much of the weeds here, um, but uh, one thing the book is pushing back on that I think does maybe have implications for politics today um, is it, one, one take on this is that the Republican Party had a sort of limited anti-slavery program that we talked about, uh, the opposition to slavery extension, but not slavery itself, represented a kind of retreat or a diminution or a dilution or an adulteration of the more radical abolitionist movement uh, that had preceded. And I, I want to push back against that in a couple of ways. First, as Marianne Shep Carey pointed out, uh, I don't think this conventional account registers the ways in which the emergence of the Republicans as a national force actually uh, deepened rather than diminished uh, the radical potential of the anti-slavery struggle uh, by narrowing and, and heightening all American politics into what was effectively a very radicalizing binary, this collision between freedom and slavery. Uh, Republicans opened doors for a, a much more aggressive form of struggle uh, than other abolitionist critiques. And second, the crucial ingredient in this expanded struggle was to link the moral fight against slavery to the material concerns of Northern voters, to win these millions of abolitions from necessity rather than a handful from humanity. And so I want to argue that the Republican attack on the slave power, which you read about it can happen also in Foner, uh, Bill Foner, uh, was not just a wild-eyed conspiracy theory or a defense of Republican government against Southern aggression or any number of things, but really, ultimately, I want to flesh, try to flesh this out, an exercise of class politics capable of rallying uh, an expanded Northern public against the whole of the slaveholding class itself. Okay, so first, um, suit, I, I have to touch you with one more Seward quote, I'm sorry. Um, on the Republican platform, very really briefly, because there's always a lot of emphasis on, on, the, on its limits, both by contemporary abolitionists and historians, but I think, uh, for one, Republicans said a lot of things about why the, uh, the, the effort to quarantine and isolate slavery was a method to kill slavery. But leaving that aside, um, Seward had, I think, the best explanation for why the Republican Party shouldn't be judged by its specific documents or proposals, but the kind of deeper political antagonism that it called up, that gave it sort of energy and direction in the world. And I think this kind of analysis applies uh, in a lot of ways today, too. He says, the character and fidelity of any party are determined necessarily not by its pledges, programs, and platforms, by the public exigencies and the temper of the people when they call it into activity. Subserviency to slavery is a law written not only on the forehead of the Democratic Party, but also in its very soul. So resistance to slavery and devotion to freedom, the popular elements now actively working for the Republican Party among the people, must and will be the resources for its ever renewing strength and constant invigoration. I mean, this is maybe one of, for me, like the fullest, richest statements of politics, not policy, is the way to sort of make sense of how a political movement is operating in the world. And because, and, and, and I think the Republican experience bears Seward out, from 1854 to 1860, Republican anti-slavery agitation, both in a kind of calm response dialectic with, with, with the Northern electorate, forcibly reorganized, realigned American politics around this one binary of slavery and freedom. I'm not going to go into details of the, the political chronology in that period, but but that's essentially what happened. With, with Republicans established as a major party, uh, this kind of rhetoric multiplied across the national elections of the 50s, coursed through stump speeches, ra mass rallies, newspapers, periodicals, converting in some ways the ordinary infrastructure of electoral 
electoral politics into a vast propaganda apparatus against uh, the, ruling, the ruling slaveholding class. And in this sense, the emergence of a nationally competitive anti-slavery party didn't narrow the scope, but expanded it, right? Uh, it regularly scheduled struggles with Antebellum politics, uh, offered anti-slavery forces further chances to expand their rhetorical war on slave power. Striking thing that I'm finding is it's, it's, it's almost always an election time that the anti-slavery rhetoric gets hottest. The, it's not, it's the, the moment where the party, where the, where the Republican Party becomes more conservative and draws back is when it's most removed from the people. Um, if skeptical historians persist in seeing the party of Lincoln and Seward as a party of slavery non-extension, slave owners themselves knew better. Republicans were, as the 1856 Democratic platform put it, preeminently a party of slavery agitation. Uh, that is their bread and butter, and there, I could read a thousand newspaper quotes from the South about how uh, the word slavery function, furnishes to the sexual agitation its chief argument and support. By hammering home on this question, on this word, they actually won Northern votes. They, they, didn't, they, they, they didn't shrink from it. The desperate hope of Annabelle conservatives, uh, whatever their programmatic position on slavery uh, in Kansas or slavery in the territories, etc., slavery in the Constitution, was to kill this sexual agitation. Uh, by once and for all, thereby saving the Union from a reckoning, a radical reckoning with slavery. Um, and but while previous party leaderships, from the Federalist Party to the Jeffersonians to the Whigs to the Democrats, had all sought to stifle, essentially, or at least to diffuse or soothe over, smooth over popular anti-slavery sentiment in the North, Republicans responding to the manifest will of the people in the 1850s refused to let it die. In fact, they they put their feet on the gas, especially in the elections of 1856 and 1860. And, and you know, you can follow this, the power of this anti-slavery feeling through an infinity of sources uh, that I won't, I won't come into, newspapers, rallies, speeches, etc. But to a large extent, uh, and this is another kind of question of origins and causality, uh, the newfound power of this anti-slavery appeal certainly benefited from the activist labors of American abolitionists, from William Lloyd Garrison to Harriet Beecher Stowe, etc., who had spent decades decrying slavery as a sin and a crime and so on. Lincoln is the, with Brother Phillips, you know, I had a great line, uh, Lincoln is in place, Garrison is in power after Lincoln takes office. And so in some sense, there's like, that's another narrative of the story is that these sort of activist vanguard kind of sows the seed, which the Republicans then harvest. Douglas uses that metaphor, too. Um, and there's, there's some truth there, but I think it would be a mistake to regard the mass politics of anti-slavery as they emerged after 1854 as just a kind of exercise in consciousness raising, which is often actually how the abolitionists talked about it. Uh, well, Republicans like Seward and Sumner, Charles Sumner, often adopted the kind of moral intensity of Garrisonian uh, polemics. Um, they also appealed to a very material self-interest, right, of Northern voters. Uh, above all, the pink <coughs> battle of slavery is a species of class struggle, not simply between slaves and masters, but between the overwhelming majority of Americans and this tiny aristocracy of slave lords who control the federal government. And this is where, you know, for a story like Ganap, who some of you read, and others, there's this real emphasis on kind of, you know, doing a gotcha on Republicans by saying, because they emphasize, they appeal to self-interest, they really didn't care about slavery. Uh, et cetera, or this just shows the limits of anti-slavery appeal. Um, but in some ways, of course, I mean, my, my, my premise on this is that the fusion of a moral and material appeal is what makes both of them powerful. Um, as the Republican, and, and, and it's striking how often they talked about it in, in very explicitly in class terms, even more than, than a lot of the examples that Phil Brunner gives about Republicans appealing to industrial workers. I think it wasn't even a sort of a industrial working class versus everyone. It was a kind of, uh, the, class, the class dimensions are, are more complex when you talk about that. Frank Blair has a great quote, who's hardly an anti-slavery radical, but as he put it in 1856, the contest ought not to be considered a sectional one, but rather the war of a class, the slaveholders, against the laboring people of all classes. And this kind of populism came pretty naturally. They were sort of old members of the Jacksonian democracy, who you read about in, in, in Bonner's book too, who converted their kind of hatreds of the, you know, the, the, the banking power, the money power, and the slave power. But under Republican auspices, it also came off the tongues of former Whigs, former defenders of banks, like Lincoln, like Seward, Horace Greeley, Thaddeus Stevens, who largely jettisoned this kind of Whig doctrine of social harmony in favor of all-out war on the slaveholding class as a class. Seward was especially energetic on this. 
His maiden speech as a Republican by vested slaveholders as a privileged class, which he later refined into a property class. Uh, his major Senate speech in 1860 divided the Republic not between North and South, but between labor states, subject to democratic self-government, and capital states, where master class barons monopolized political and economic power, quashed free speech, and organized all society by quote the system of capital and slaves. You know, strikingly for a lot of American, you know, kind of liberal American political historians, this is seen as Seward's conservative term because he's actually de-emphasizing the moral issue of slavery and kind of trying to appeal to economic issues. Um, I mean, from our perspective, it doesn't sound, um, you know, conservative or moderate, really. And it's complicated here, it's tricky, because the nature of Seward's private political beliefs it remains ambiguous even to biographers. I mean, his politics did take a moderate, if really a deeply conservative turn. After 61, he was not at the forefront of the abolition of democracy during the war. Uh, there's reason to doubt his sincere commitment to a serious struggle against what he called the slave capitalists, or any capitalists. Uh, at, at all. But what this is this is where this argument about popular democracy I think matters because the force of the Republican class conscious attack on slavery didn't grow out of individual moral conviction, but the requirements of this massive democratic politics. Uh, as Seward once winkingly said to Jefferson and Marina Davis, and Marina Davis, Jefferson's wife, wrote this down, they were like whiskey partners uh, in the 1850s. Uh, Seward said he didn't believe, and this is probably hearsay, and Marina's probably slandering him, but still. Supposedly, Seward said, I think even apocryphally, it, it, it speaks to the point. Supposedly, Seward said he didn't believe every one of his own aggressive speeches, but he knew that this rhetoric was, quote, potent to affect the rank and file of the North. And whether or not this was a revealing joke it, it, or not, it sort of is beside the point, because every player in Annabelle politics seemed to understand, especially at election time, that the way to win the Northern masses lay less in lofty vindications of the market economy, a la Eric Foner's book, then scathing attacks on the oligarchic master class. Uh, after Seward's Senate speech on capital and labor, the leading Northern Democrat, Stephen Douglas, summarized Republican strategy. He sort of was vexed at this unfair turn the Republicans had taken. They were attempting to turn the slavery debate, quote, into a question between capital and labor, so they could, quote, take the side of the numbers against the few. Uh, and that, that, wasn't, that, that much was unmistakable. That's what the Republicans were trying to do, and it wasn't with rhetoric alone. Uh, Philip Hunter talks about this, but they made a detailed effort in 1856 to make a case that the master class rule in Washington uh, actively suppressed more wages and uh, workers' wages in the North. They called James Buchanan 10 Cent Jimmy because he had once suggested that that's all a Northern worker needed uh, to sustain himself. They hitched up these dilapidated wagons packed with ragged mechanics, pantomiming labor in Buchanan workshops. That was sort of like hoo ha and fanfare of Annabelle politics. Uh, that, that Republicans really took part in, in these very specific and very pointed class terms uh, in the 1850s. The proprietors of the mines and the furnaces and forges and rolling mills declared the Albany Evening Journal, which was basically Seward's organ, were Buchanan's companions and friends, being Buchan politically bound Buchanan right as the Democratic candidate, the, the slave power candidate, being politically bound to oppose protection of American manufacturers, he could benefit the capitalists only by reducing labor wages. By 1860, the Republicans had developed this extensive economic program, specifically designed, almost like fiendishly designed, to deepen this material case against the master class rule. There's the protective tariff, a federal funding for infrastructure projects, a range of agricultural reforms especially. Uh, this is not simply the Republican hands, the way it functions politically, rather than as a kind of a new policy agenda, but the way it actually functions in the, in the kind of flesh and blood of politics. Um, it was not, not a cunning plot to advance the interests of industrial capital, although some of them eventually made it so. Uh, it, it, above all, it was a series of desirable economic goods backed by a broad majority of early voters, workers, and small farmers alike, but blocked by a rapacious, oligarchic, slaveholding class. And the political centerpiece of this struggle was, uh, was of course, the Homestead Act something no Whig or industrials would ever have dreamed of, by which the government would give away millions of acres of land for free. Now, of course, this, this operates from the kind of standard settler colonial premise of Annabelle America that the indigenous inhabitants of the continental West are not the right owners of land and it belongs to Euro-American settlers, but it, and that shouldn't be totally hand-waved the way that I just did. But, uh, but I think in the context of this politics, why this matters here, uh, it also represented an unprecedented distribution of wealth from the government to ordinary citizens. 
and, and gain kind of material, a, a kind of carrot along with, uh, uh, to the Republican our argument. And sometimes historians, Eric Croner does this too, uh, have talked about the Homestead Act as a kind of uh, expression of middle class capitalistic ideology in effort to convert sort of Eastern workers and into, into the rest of Eastern workers, into frugal and industrious uh, Western farmers, right? Uh, but the rhetoric of the Homestead Act was very different from this. It wasn't um, stop complaining about your boss and get a farm. It was uh, homesteads as necessary to, quote, resist the power of soulless capital and grasping speculation, giving away public land, said the leading advocate of homesteads, a Pennsylvania named Lucia Grow, would weaken the system of chattel slavery by making war on the kindred system of wages slavery, giving homes and employment to its victims, and equalizing the condition of the people. In this sense, I don't think it functioned or it was intended to function as a kind of social self safety valve designed to alleviate class conflict, but something closer to a political weapon of a very specific form of anti-slave power, class conflict. Uh, so this is the kind of, I mean, I'm skipping over some of the stuff so we can get to the Q&A. Um, perhaps, though, the most suggestive evidence, just to sort of move towards a conclusion, uh, one more point and then the conclusion, perhaps the most suggestive reading of Republican mass politics in this period came, I think, from contemporary black observers in a number of forms. By addressing Northern voters directly, arguing the Ohio black politician, John Mercer Langston in 1856, Republicans had enlisted the masses in a battle against bondage in a new and powerful way. The enslavement and degradation of one portion of the population, this is Langston speaking, fastens galling, fettering chains on the limbs of the other. This identification of the interests of the white and colored people of the country, this peculiarly national feature of the anti-slavery movement, is one of his most cheering, hope-inspiring, and hope-supporting characteristics. White Americans cannot stand as idle spectators to the struggle, but must unite with us in battling the fell enemy if they themselves would save their own freedom. This is another version, in some ways, of the Marianne Shack Carey point about abolitionists from necessity. And ultimately, the most influential black abolitionist in the country agree, Frederick Douglass, right? He spent, like most abolitionists, Douglass spent most of the 1800s wavering between excitement at this new anti-slavery mass politics, loyalty, uh, which maybe we can all relate to, to his very particular tendency within the abolitionist movement. Uh, Doug, for Douglas, the radical abolitionist party of Garrett Smith, which was um, one of the kind of micro groupings uh, within the abolitionist movement and unwilling to, to abandon Garrett Smith. Uh, and a fear that the Republicans, that Douglas also oscillated towards, uh, that Republicans in pursuit of electoral success would abandon the anti-slavery struggle altogether. But as the first Republican national campaign gained momentum in 1856, it was striking that Douglas was always most optimistic about the Republicans when they were most radical, which was in the heat of national campaigns. Uh, he found himself deluged with angry letters and threats to cancel subscriptions to his newspaper. He had a heavily black subscriber base and readership. Uh, and in August of 1856, he endorsed the Republicans in the party best position to strike a blow at the slave oligarchy chiefly in their agitation of the larger question. And this is where that, that binary comes into play. He said there is now but one question of widespread and all commanding national interest, and that question is freedom or slavery. By reorganizing politics around this binary, uh, Douglas argued Republicans would not disarm the struggle against bondage, but mobilize it, concentrate, and heighten it. One by one, the old parties have been driven from the pro-slavery settlement of the South. They were done, oh God, they absolutely agreed Douglas. Um, that's the point. Uh, the party is formed. What, what he said ultimately is that despite what agitate, what, what sort of demagogues may say, and what the party itself might not understand, the party quote is formed and its purpose is fixed, and that purpose is to destroy slavery. And North Douglas having endorsed the Republican candidate hesitates to endorse Republican political, hesitate to adopt Republican political rhetoric, with class conscious appeals to white voters. He urged Northern working men, the laboring class of this country, the bone and sinew of the land, uh, to decide the election. In voting for the allies and tools of the master class, Douglas told the poor white mechanics of the North, you vote for your own enslavement, but if you vote against Fremont, or you vote for Fremont, you're not going to have the power to strike a death blow at the Republican, at the slave power. Okay, uh, a range of testimony, a range of sources, that, that's essentially the argument. I want to be clear as I wrap up. That the Annabelle version of this mass political abolition democracy shouldn't be like a cause for some kind of naive historical celebration. All of these internal frontiers of American electoral politics, 
racial, gender, economic, and other remained all too real. Uh, Republican celebrations of the working class did not really make them a genuinely working class party, as we would understand it. The working class was in some ways as divided as ever on ethno-religious grounds. Um, uh, much less the Social Democratic Party, uh, and even at the height of its power after 1856, this same this tenuous bond between slaves and northern workers, and I'm uh, sorry, northern, northern voters, was also easily ruptured by the counter-revolution of property uh, that Du Bois described in the Reconstruction Era that some would say was already brewing within Republican ranks by the late 50s. So, yes, there are limits, and yet, if we seek to understand how the largest slaveholding society in the 19th century world was demolished and revolutionized in just a few years. I think we do need to rethink this history. The idea that the Northern electorate ever, that a majority of the Northern electorate ever really sought to destroy slavery, as Douglas had it, has never really sat well, I think, with American historians. Uh, and I don't think it sits well with them today, necessarily. Uh, we'll see what the, what the response to this book is. As the historian Seymour Drescher once said about British abolitionism, for many scholars, it wasn't, the problem wasn't that it was too good to be true, but that it was too true to be good. Uh, there's this desire to sort of lapse from a kind of a, uh, you know, a kind of moralistic enthusiasm to a moralistic skepticism. Uh, but the issue here isn't for us. I think it shouldn't be goodness, but understanding. Uh, it's the fusion of anti-slavery energy. It was the fusion of anti-slavery energy and mass democratic politics, more than any other development, I think, in 19th century history, economic or otherwise, that marked the course of slavery's destruction in the United States. And the more intimately we grapple with this truth, the more uh, we will understand its implications. Okay, that's the talk. Sorry if that went a little long. Did do was 
build a, not, not a, um, they didn't claim the whole of the working class, but they did build a working class base for anti-slavery, which had not existed. They did cohere it, and they did make it uh, as voters as a key part of their party. So maybe if you ask about organized, work, organized workers' movements, I mean, these are still very, very small. I think the context here uh, is important. First of all, the population is 80%, even in the North, 1960s, 80% agricultural. Uh, organized, so industrial workers are already a pretty small proportion of the, of the, of the, of the population. And in organized labor movements are still very, I mean, there, there are Philadelphia trades unions groups and New York trades unions groups, but they're, they're still very rudimentary and not, um, they're, they're not like the kind of um, labor organizations that, that developed in, you know, even the Knights of Labor that developed in the later half of the 19th century. So, um, I, I, I don't think the Republicans really, uh, you know, Foner's book, that comes from a larger book, Philip Foner's book on the history of organized labor, so that's kind of his focus. But I don't think if you're thinking about the politics of the 1850s, organized labor is necessarily in the forefront. Um, I think, uh, but I do think the class politics of labor are really interesting, and the Republicans were in a lot of ways, uh, they were certainly the first party to fuse a kind of a class conscious appeal to workers across uh, across the lines of slavery and free labor, uh, and basically sort of pointing out that the, the, the kind of the lords of the loom and the lords of the lash uh, had teamed up against workers, black and white alike. That was something the Jacksonians never did. That was something that you know most abolitionists didn't really do, uh, and uh, that was a very powerful fusion in a lot of places. Um, and, and you should also remember that oh, well, I'll, I'll stop there. Actually, so yeah. let's uh, nice. let's take one from the audience. Um, savvy swap of the kind of slaveholding and 
way, really, that um, that that didn't have that, that wasn't wasn't necessarily hostile to any kind of economic transformation in the north, uh, but uh, but was hostile to the sort of democratic politics of anti-slavery. Uh, so that's kind of where the revolution came uh, for me. Uh, these places 
are extremely rural. You have to travel miles and miles and miles to get there. Uh, the theater really brought people in, and yeah, they would have these. They're, they're, they did a lot of a lot of um, uh, a lot of dress up. Basically, there was one thing which was a lot about the gender politics of the period where they would have wagons of uh, um, thirty-two. You know, I don't know, 32 like young virginal women dressed in white to represent all the states, and then one dressed in black, which is Kansas, which is like under siege from the kind of, you know, you know, the kind of dark power of pro-slavery. But they would also do this kind of class stuff where they would have these wagons of like people, like workers in a, in a dilapidated Buchanan workshop. I mean, they did all sorts of blackface too. I mean, it's a lot of ugly stuff, like or stuff that we would we would not approve. But the 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 the, the, the class populism. Definitely in there, and yeah, this is this is more in the context of like a mass procession at a big rally where you would have you know people doing dress up. Do I think we should do more dress up? Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think I think that kind of that kind of theatricality could be a part. Uh, it's tricky because you don't want to become too theatery all the time, but I think it's worth thinking about for sure. Thanks. Uh, live, I saw your hand go up. Yeah. Um, I would love if you could talk a little bit more about the Homestead Act, because I'm kind of a little in trouble trying to reconcile your like major take that it's not moral purity that drove like any other slavery in mass politics, which I totally agree with, like totally a murder. But it seems like you're saying, but correct me if I'm wrong, that it, it kind of was a moralism that you were able to support the Homestead Act over like a No, I mean, I mean, this is free land. I mean, the idea is, and so it's complicated because, yeah, there is a reading in which we want to put all politics as a homestead act is a means of kind of, you know, class compromise rather than heightening class tension, say, in a kind of urban environment. Where you say, oh, you know, that's Horace Greeley's idea. Um, you know, the anti slavery wig, and then later Republicans like, no, we need to, you know, buy yourself a farm instead of, oh, you're Really, with another worker, another I think it was George Evans who said, "Vote yourself a farm." The idea is that you know we remove this excess population in from you know crap, increasingly crowded, destitute northern cities, and we give everybody farms. Then you know they won't you know kill their bosses or something like that. So in that sense, there is a class politics to it also, and that's from above, and that's why people have been often skeptical of land reformers and and homestead act. Kind of politics as opposed to, say, the politics of, you know, struck mass strikes. But the, the way actually land reform emerged was not as a kind of a fiendish plot by the bosses, but actually a demand by workers. And it emerged out of organized labor. Um, it, the, the National Land Reform, I can't remember the, the name of the organization. And the way it functioned in Republican politics, more importantly, by the 1850s, was. I don't think it actually spoke to urban workers very much at all. In fact, very few urban workers, when they, there was a Homestead Act in the Institute in 1860, they took advantage of it uh, and claimed their uh, 180, 160 acres. Um, it was mostly speaking to uh, the existing population of small farmers, who, uh, which is most of the population of the country, who might very well have the tools and the skills and the ability to get their own land, but, um, you know, in a place like Ohio or Illinois, where you know had fewer opportunities uh, by 1860, and might want to move to Kansas, and uh, that uh, being able to buy to get land for free, uh, as opposed to have to buy it from a speculator, was a really significant kind of economic incentive. So in that sense, it was and it, it, the, the the way that the question was argued in Congress was almost always defenders of large you know slaveholders and. Sort of Eastern banking interests almost always oppose this because it blocked the kind of land speculation market and it threatened to sort of set up, it threatened to sort of rapidly populate the West with non-slave holding smallholders. Um, so both the, the slave power and the kind of commercial elite were really skeptical, and it was regarded as a kind of agrarian policy, which was you know uh, the idea that the government shouldn't provide anything free as a, as a as a, as a basic good, as a universal public good, and that land, which is the most valuable kind of productive 
property in this kind of society should just be given away for free was substantively radical, I think, in the 19th century. And the, the speeches on the Homestead Act are really interesting because a lot of them begin with this kind of evocation of like, land should be free as the sun and as the air, um, you know, which is in some ways a, a kind of a declaration of, you know, we could say universal rent control or something like that. Like everyone should have, have should have a land on, and a home on which to sort of, you know, subsist. And uh, in that sense, I think it, 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 in terms of the political antagonisms that it actually calls up um, between, um, you know, in effect, kind of the idea of this idea of a property holding democracy against uh, speculators and slaveholders, uh, it has a very different function. So I don't think it was, and I don't think it was particularly moralistic. I think it was about appealing to uh, a, a genuine desire on the part of um, a very mobile agricultural population to potentially move to fertile land and claim it for free uh, on behalf of, you know, uh, by, by availing themselves of this government program, basically. Uh, and you know, it, it's interesting to get into the complexities of the Homestead Act. Because some people on the right love it too. They go like, this is the greatest privatization plan in world history. <laughs> and that's like one take. But that but no champion of kind of um, the, the capitalist class in the period was regarded that way. They almost universally opposed it as the kind of government um, you know, uh, Jack Bootedly stepping in on the market, in on, on the land market, and giving it away to agrarian, you know, forces that have like muscled their way into this demand through power of the franchise. Anyway, sorry, it's too long. I'm going to do one from the group. Brad, you have to see your hand up and try to ask one from the group. And that's, I think that's still in a lot of ways how things go. 
And it's not just my point here in emphasizing actually the kind of internal work of the Republican Party in generating momentum is not to say that those aggravating events didn't cause outrage uh, among a broader northern public, including northern workers and northern small farmers, and you know, overwhelmingly, including even people who hold up voting Democratic in the North, mostly hated all of those sort of southern slave power aggressions. They, what the Republicans did do um, is at, at, at many, at, at, at several stages, but particularly in 54, to go back to Kansas, Nebraska, is zoom in on a moment of crisis and offer a kind of radicalizing rather than a calming alternative. So in, instead of saying, simply saying, let's restore the Missouri Compromise, the Republicans have broken it, you know, let's, you know, I don't know, let's uh, uh, wipe away the Trump tax cuts, you know, or whatever, you know, the kind of version of like, let's go back to the status quo ante. Republicans said, no new slave, no slavery in the territories, period. Which is more aggressive than the Missouri Compromise had ever been. That had drawn a line in the sand. Republicans were very quickly not willing to accept that line. And because of the outrage, it kind of ratcheted up the kind of minimum demand of Northern politics. So I think, um, and then, and then, you know, by so in part, I think that helps. That's how they kind of help build Northern, help build power. Same thing. They got very adept in the politics of kind of provocation. Uh, where they would sort of provoke Southerners into saying and doing outrageous things, and then using that as a license to kind of push their own more aggressive policy. I mean, Sumner's beatdown in the floor of the Senate came after he delivered this epic speech, uh, you know, called um, "The Crime Against Kansas," which was like full of these like lurid descriptions of slavery as a crocodile monster dropping her reptile egg. And, you know, and he, he had a lot of personal attacks on, like, he made fun of a stutter in South Carolina and all sorts of stuff and outraged Southern honor. But it was also a really aggressive abolitionist speech, basically. It was reprinting the Liberator and Frederick Douglass's paper and all these other places. It was hot enough for the abolitionist left, you know, delivered by a senator. And then it became the Republican Party, like, campaign document after he got beaten up because he became the hero. It was, like, the most leftmost Republican, you know, uh, political elected official basically became the sort of symbol of the Republican campaign that year and for many years after. So it, that also kind of weaponized and kind of accelerated this this sort of, I think, this radicalizing momentum. So anyway, we can go through a bunch of these different events, but I think that's the basic pattern. I didn't really talk about the worker side, but maybe we'll get back to that. Sure. Uh, thanks. This one's, this one's one of the ones from the group. Uh, how would you pronounce the last name of the second neighbor that you, or the second neighbor that you, Ganat. Is that Oh, Ganat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ganat. I think I'm Ganat. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
because that's the function. It's not necessarily about any kind of um, hereditary privilege in a kind of classic European sense. It's about a tiny knot of property elites. I mean, Seward talks about a property class. They, they use aristocracy very overlappingly, interestingly, with capital. I mean, Seward is always talking about this, you know, he's talking about the South as capital states where ca slave capital rules. And um, so to me, the point isn't so much actually about like this political rhetoric making a really fine and valuable uh, distinction in the sort of complex society, uh, the sort of complex sociology of, of, of the South, which was very unequal, um, but, um, but rather kind of calling attention to the, the political dominance of slaveholders in the South and the way in which even in states like, say, Alabama, where there were a lot of slaveholders, but they were a, dist a, a tiny minority of, uh, of, of, of even the sort of white population in Alabama, 70 some percent of the legislature was slaveholders. And the entire, you know, the kind of unquestionable premise of Southern politics was uh, literally written into uh, many Southern state constitutions. Um, so kind of outside of even the actual compass of day-to-day -day Southern politics was, you cannot pass a law to abolish slavery. That was kind of like almost pre-political for the slaveholding class. And any deviation from that was to be I mean, there was no democratic politics in the South in, that, in this sense. And this is what um, Republicans really feasted on. In 1856, there's a famous incident where, not famous, but famous to me because I've been reading a lot of these famous days, you can say, um, where two guys, in, two English guys in Mobile, Alabama, were caught selling a copy of Frederick Douglass's About My Body and My Freedom. And they were, you know, they were run out of town at gunpoint. And the North makes a big fuss over this because it just shows like there is no, there's no free speech, there's no, um, there's nothing like even basic political liberty in the South, and that's because of this class ruled by slaveholders, and, and such that it's impossible to have a sense of what the average non-slaveholder in the North in the South really thinks about slavery. And of course, this leads to all sorts of over-excited calculations that you know the average non-slaveholding Southerner will you know turn against the slaveholders as soon as the Civil War breaks out. That didn't happen. In fact, they were able to muster a huge amount of support for the existing regime after 1861. So it's not that the public can necessarily write about that, um, although there were really significant pockets of Unionist resistance too. Um, but that, uh, but I think the critique of the, of the slaveholders' power means that it becomes kind of a black box when Southern society looks like. All we know is that the slaveholders dominated in this like totally inegalitarian, uh, you know, undemocratic and kind of property-based, capital-based way. Take one from the audience. Uh, uh, let's go here. I say uh, yeah. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, so like uh, you said, the classic kind of Marxist view, and also Philip Thoreau talks about it a little bit that there were industrial, northern industrial capital interests that were in opposition to slave power and increases like tariffs. Yeah. Um, how and then Thoreau talks about it as a coalition between those industrial interests and uh, mass movement. How important were the, those industrial interests in the formation of the Republican Party? Because it seems like you completely yeah. brushed them off almost, but how, and then and, and just to relate it to today, if this was largely a popular movement back then, what lessons can we learn to sort of establish a new, a similar popular movement today? Do we have to form a new party? Do we work with it? Yeah, I mean the second one's a big one, so we'll see how you do on that. The first one is 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 um, is, is an important point. It's true. Um, and now I'm now I'm thinking I need to figure out how to figure out how to signpost is better, telegraph is better, this catalyst these two, because you're right, like and Foner does do a, a good job of all times Philip Foner, that is, of kind of signaling that of course this wasn't, you know, this this there were industrialists who were Republicans, um, and they did, especially by 1860, more so than 1856, I think, um, represent a significant, um, disproportionate to their vote size, a significant political part of the coalition in terms of the leadership and so on. Um, I think, I mean, first, chronologically, it's interesting. In 56, economic elites almost overwhelmingly are scared, like, are scared shitless of the Republican Party. I mean, they really can't fundraise. It's actually really interesting. There's no, there's no small donor, there's no small donor 
economy can be fixed. Like that they don't need that much money to run the campaigns because a lot of things happen. A lot of these actually do fast. Theatrical productions are generally organized locally and aren't run through some kind of campaign thing. But to the extent that they have are struggling to do or are trying to raise money to distribute documents, um, which is a significant part of this, is like get a copy of some speech in every household. You know, the Republican campaign committee is really keen on that, and pay money for speakers. Uh, to you know, for sewers and so on, and little sewers to run around Pennsylvania screaming about the slave power. Um, they, they really are completely outdone by the Democrats in 1856. They, 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 the Republican fundraisers in New York and Philadelphia come up completely dry. Um, and meanwhile, all sorts of like old, not just Democrat, you know, commercial Democrats, but um, you know, big bankers and so on are are, are donating to Republican funds. By 1860. I think that does shift a bit, and um, in part because it is true, even if the Republicans formulate a, a, a kind of political program that speaks to, that makes the kind of slavery question more material for a lot of American workers, on um, the tariff question and on the homestead question, a lot of what they want is congruent with what you know railroad builders want. Um, and that's just, I mean, in some ways you have to say, even I would have to say that I don't love that, but that is, speaks to the sort of reality of coalition building in a two-party system, uh, or even in a two- or three-party system. You know, and I think there were four candidates in 1860, but there were only really two in the North. Um, and, um, and in some ways, that was really, those, those elements were really useful. The, the, the trickier part of the narrative is, over the course of the 1860s, um, that kind of, and this is a lot of this is in David Montgomery's great book, Beyond Equality, um, the kind of manufacturing and ultimately the kind of new wartime financial class that emerges in the 1860s really begins to take over the leadership of the party, not just be a part of it, but dominate it. I don't think that was true yet in 1860, though. Um, on the second question, who, uh, what are, what are, I mean, in terms of, I mean, I guess I would say that it's, it, like, if you're trying to like run the tape, and some of it depends on where, which is, which is a foolhardy thing to do, but I guess we're here, we should talk about it, I don't know. Like, where in the, I, and I, cause I've talked about this over drinks and stuff with people, like, where in this time frame are we in this moment? If you're trying to say we're looking for, you know, a political revolution today, are we, are we in 1856, are we on the verge, or 1854, are we on the verge of founding a new party that's about to sort of realign American politics around, you know, Medicare for all or something? It doesn't seem to me that we're quite there yet um, in terms of my analysis of the party system. Um, uh, and there are huge the obstacles that a lot of people talked about to, to sort of party breakup are so much larger today than they were even in the late 19th century, let alone in this period. So, um, you know, it, that, that's a tricky question in terms of the sort of party split question. But I do think some of the sort of um, the ways in which uh, the Republicans, um, the, the way the Republicans were, with the benefit of their own organization, able to um, clarify, heighten, and sort of simplify politics, uh, speak to some of the things that I think Bernie was able to do, even within with, 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 with the platform within the Democratic Party. So, uh, I mean, that's probably obvious, but I do think that that's um, that's that, that, that has influenced in some way the way I think about this. Uh, in the former piece, it talks about Abraham Lincoln was like this champion for working people, and you know workers saw that in that way he directly appealed to them. Was there any indication that like Republican elites were afraid of Lincoln as a figure and they kind of control him, or that the, the movement would like somehow get? I wish. You know, that would be cool. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean he was a corporation lawyer too. I mean, I mean he had done his you know his biggest cases for the Illinois Central, which. You know, which, by the way, I think it should be clear for me, railroads in the kind of late 19th century Gilded Age context, they kind of are the sort of, you know, the vanguard of this new industrial capitalist order. And they do function that way, especially by the 1870s, 1880s. And of course, they were, most of them were all private corporations before. But it's also true that railroads were, especially sort of forms of state support railroads, were a kind of public infrastructure. And there'd be a lot of reasons why you might want a railroad if you were in the North, even if you weren't a capitalist. Um, uh, so I, I don't want to say that, that that means that Lincoln was like kind of at the tip of the spear of you know the kind of you know 
the market revolution or a kind of um, a capitalist lackey or tool, which by the way you can read like great kind of mid mid-century Marxist takes on Lincoln that way. Um, you can also read, you know, closer to Boner's point, you know, a book put together in 1910 called Little so Sermons and Socialism by Abraham Lincoln, which just kind of, um, which was like in the Debsian era, it just kind of collects his most populist quotes about, you know, populist sounding quotes about labor and capital. It's like, hey, this guy was a socialist. So the truth is both of these things were operating in tension. And so um, I think I think it is true that Lincoln's lived reality.